Hey, Jesse. Hello, hello. How's it going? Oh, good. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Fun to see everybody coming in. Yeah, I'm just adding everybody up. Hey, Justin. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. I really Hi. appreciate it. This should be fun. Hi, Annika. I just uh, added you both as co-hosts, so you can also add people up. Thank you. Sophia. I haven't spoken to so many of you in so long, so it's like a reunion for me. Hi, Sophia. Hi. <laughs> What's up? How are you guys? I'm good. Who is still missing? We have... Hi, Raphael. How are you? Hey. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you guys, uh, the ones I didn't meet yet, and nice to see everyone. I just added uh, Helena up as well. And then we're just missing, I think, Eric. And I think, is Itzel here already? I haven't it's seen her. No, I haven't seen her. Okay. I think she was in the, the art blocks. I was in the art blocks one just before this. And I think both uh, oh. she and Eric will probably be coming from there. All right. Um, Jesse, do you want to kick us off? And then we can add them up as, as they come. Uh, wait, so we don't, we don't want to, there's a couple, there's a couple of people still oh, okay. in route. Yeah, sure. Let's wait. Do we have music? Next time we need some, some music. <laughs> Waiting room music. <laughs> Did you see that TikTok that was making the claim that lo-fi hip hop is the, uh, uh, smooth jazz for millennials. Oh no, I haven't. But okay, <laughs> Sorry, no, now we know. <laughs> <laughs> now we know what we have to do. Oh, that's that's uh, it's uh, yeah, both. Yeah, we got we got both. And Eric, great. Everyone's here now. Hi. Hello. Hey guys. Hello, hello. How's it going? Hey, hey. This squad's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, top notch. Yeah. All right. Well, here we are. We've got everybody here. Um, I'll uh, briefly introduce myself and then and then throw to Nicole and, and Annika. My name is Jesse Damiani. I'm a curator, writer, and advisor in new media art and emerging technologies, and really excited to be talking to everybody. Hi, I'm Annika, same writer and curator, and Jesse and I are working, I think, on two exhibitions at the moment for the museum in Linz, uh, having to do with digital art. And yeah, we'll tell you more, I think, uh, early next week. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. We're really happy about once again, a brilliant uh, round of speakers. And the topic this week is generative art, uh, what's behind the code. And yeah, um, I guess we have sort of like everyone um, uh, who might uh, have a lot to say about this topic and like always we can't have like everyone we could have invited so please people don't worry uh, we're doing more talks on each topic so the ones we couldn't invite this time because we sadly can't have 30 or 40 speakers we'll do more um yeah with all of you probably at some point um so yeah um nicole do you want to take over from here yeah, sure. I was just tweeting out um, the, the spaces. Um, so my name is Nicole. I um, I guess I'm the face behind Vertical Crypto Art. Um, I'm very happy to be hosting these conversations and also to have a chance to catch up with many people that I can't or I'm not able to speak to. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation very much. Um, do we want to start with some brief introductions for the speakers and then go from there? Cool. Okay. I'm just going to go at the order that I have on the screen. So Justin, you're first. <laughs> okay, great. Love going first. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. So basically, um, how I landed in the crazy world of NFTs, uh, around 2015, we, uh, myself and some friends were playing around with VR and trying to incorporate traditional art, um, scanning paintings and sculptures and stuff and trying to 
move it into a VR environment just to try to explore the idea of having more permanence um, in an environment where it couldn't, the art couldn't be destroyed by like a natural disaster or warfare or whatever. And then also the obviously um, accessibility aspect of it. Not everyone can travel all over the world and go to museums, but they can put on a, a headset and explore art that way. Um, but it's, it's still super early on and uh like we were playing with with the the development kits from oculus and oculus wasn't part of facebook yet it was uh not a lot of people had headsets so anyway kind of worked around uh trying to figure out that and then in 2017 mid 2017 i got super lucky and found out about the CryptoPunks project and because of everything i've been working about working on i'd also been interested in crypto and i've been at like and had anonymous accounts on crypto twitter and stuff but it, it never i never connected all the dots between uh all the def- different technologies and as soon as i saw crypto punks I w- it immediately clicked with me like the permanence value of having the blockchain involved and also the provenance and so that led me uh down the rabbit hole of nfts and then um fast forward a few more years, uh, 2020 decided been watching the markets for a while and things had been in a long sideways kind of acquisition period. And I felt like these are all my interests in one. And I really just wanted to come be involved as a builder. And so I decided to not be anonymous anymore, joined the punk discord and Twitter under my own name and you know kind of kind of got reintegrated with that whole scene and that's how and that's when eric was working on uh, art blocks and i found that super interesting and that really introduced me to generative art and i dove down the generative art rabbit hole and i've still yet to come out i'm still a total noob really especially in, in it, with the, amongst this panel but uh i just find it all fascinating and I'm really obsessed with the idea of art and tech in general and seeing how they, how they merge and seeing you know, how things develop. So that's kind of where I am now. I think that's a fair, I'll leave it at that for now. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Eric, which is a good, good lead way in actually. <laughs> yeah. Hey everybody. I'm Eric. Uh, I'm the founder and uh, of Artblocks, but also, a huge fan and went through a very similar uh, journey as, as Justin did. Uh, in fact, when I first saw punks, I saw it number one as a generative project. And then also kind of that crazy moment of, Oh shoot, we can uh, prove ownership of something digital. And uh, I don't know that I would have necessarily claimed punks if they weren't generative. I think I would have, but you know, there was, there was other stuff going on at the time. Um, and yeah, uh, in that, in that, time i was also kind of working with projection mapping and writing a bunch of code and touch designer and python to kind of create my own algorithmic works um so it all kind of aligned and a few years later i launched art blocks and i get to be on stage with these just absolutely insane people and even be uh in a room with some even um further insane people that i see in this room uh so it's just it's a really wonderful thing what's going on Super. Um, Casey. Hi, everybody. The first thing I wanted to do is just to say hello to so many people who are here who I haven't talked with in a while. It's really nice to be sharing space. Um, I do a lot of things. I'm an artist. Um, I'm an educator. I've been teaching at UCLA for almost 20 years now. I'm a co-founder of the Processing Software, which is a coding language and environment and community that's all about... um, artists and designers learning how to code. I think I'm here today in my sort of is my role of a co-founder of Feral File. Feral File is an online gallery space and um, it's really founded on the idea of group shows and the ideas of uh, curated shows. And we've started that um, about a year and a half ago. We launched our first show about um, in March of last year. And then we've had um, 12 shows now over the year. And we have a lot of things queued up for this year, and I'm really excited to share that with everybody when the time comes. 
Thank you. I loved the latest show uh, that Arnhem curated. Um, but yeah, Helena, hi. Hello. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so I'm Helena Seren. Thank you for inviting me. I've been an artist and software engineer for many years. Uh, and seven years ago, I was downsized from uh, corporate and I started doing some consulting gigs. And this is how I discovered uh, AI, uh, specifically generative adversarial networks, trained them on my art, on my photography. Uh, the results were kind of interesting. I started sharing it on Twitter. I started got, uh, getting invitations to like talks, MIT, uh, Library of Congress, started getting <clears throat> uh, orders for my prints. And I thought this is how my life kind of like goes on. It's, it's a nice stable income and then COVID happened and basically everything was terminated and this is how I basically got into NFTs. Um, did uh, some nice work with Super Rare, uh, nice and sweet and short period with the Hick and Nunc and now I'm kind of like doing foundation a little bit but basically thinking in uh, this year, uh, taking uh, all, all the stuff I did more into the physical artifacts stuff. So, yeah, that's my spiel. Thank you, Elena. It's great to have you. Uh, Rafael. Hi, everyone. I'm Rafael. Um, I've been making art online since about 1999. Um, I was in art school and I was experimenting with color and interactivity. And I remember just making experiments on the computer and thinking, oh, I can show these to the whole world. So, and then the, my whole thing was that I would make specific works in domain names and sort of testing what the browser could do at the time and as time went on. And I've always thought of it as uh, abstraction for the sake of necessity similar to early video games or postage stamps or early woodblock printing where technology is limited and you have to sort of be creative to find the limits of what's possible. So limited color, limited movement, and, and, and that sort of restriction and thinking in systems that stayed with me always. And so over the years, I, I made all these websites, these little ideas, each in their own domain name. And then crypto came along and then it sort of made me reconsider, oh, I use domain names as a way to create value for digital experiences. And this is another way, and this kind of shook up my whole world. And I was skeptic at first, and then it just went much better than I had expected. And I met a lot of new people through this, but um, yeah, I, it, just Google me, maybe that's the best way to see what I'm talking about. It's easier to see, but I'm always trying to bring feelings and color and abstraction through code and, and try to make things that feel personal, even though they're funneled through a machine. Perfect. I think uh, Excel just got kicked out, but I think you're back, right? Let me know if you can hear us. I can see you as a speaker on here but maybe not. Twitter is playing up. Uh, in the meantime, Sophia. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, I was say, which one? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, right. of course. Um, <laughs> go for it, Sophia. Sophia C. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, well, hello, everyone. Really nice to you. Um, Did we lose her? Oh no, we're getting we're getting crazy yeah. rugged today. Yes, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Do you hear me? Oh, yes, we, we can yes. now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> now I was saying, um, yeah, I'm Sophia Crespo. Um, I'm an artist. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Um, can you hear me? It's Twitter. It's not you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> so, um, well, I don't know what you heard, but I was saying, I'm um, Sophia.
Okay. I don't know what's happening, but uh, it seems like my mic turns off every time I speak. <laughs> Yeah, we I'm can finding hear you now. Mine, yeah, 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 mine mine keeps going from unmuted to on, so I think maybe some of us are. Yeah. <laughs> the system's forcing some actions on us. Okay, so I'm gonna be looking at it all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically, I've been making art for um, a long time since I was a kid. But in 2018, I was introduced to. AI techniques or neural networks, whatever you would like to call it. And I became really fascinated with generative art. It opened a whole new um, a world that I hadn't seen before. So um, I started to navigate it from the perspective of not knowing anything, not knowing how to code. Um, and kind of learning by um, making lots um, So I say like, break it till you make it, because that's kind of my motto in, during the time that, um, or, or how I was uh, introduced to this, this world of generative art. Uh, very quickly on, I discovered that something that I was fascinated with was looking at natural shapes um, and things that remind me of the, the natural world because very often I notice that we look at kind of computers as like the given something, um, sorry, something that we created that's completely artificial and like there's a divide with the natural world. So I began exploring this this place where, where these two worlds meet and yeah, I, I think it's called artificial life simulations or it has a lot of different names, but that's kind of like the place that that I really love. And um, and basically NFTs, like I relate a lot to what Helena said about being like beginning of 2020, suddenly realizing that all my gigs had been canceled as an artist and I didn't know what would happen. So, um, yeah, I, I suddenly struck me. I was in Colombia, stuck with the pandemic and barely had money to pay rent that month. And all my gigs had been canceled. So I realized, like, how am I going to get out of this? And fortunately, I had been introduced to NFTs before. So, um, yeah, that became kind of a thing uh, that I started considering more seriously, whereas before I saw it like a bit like uh, with a skeptic look. I didn't know like fully what to expect. And yeah, that's basically my story so far. Um, well, Ixchels who's here has helped a lot uh, to make me feel comfortable in the space as well. So yeah, can't wait to hear what she shares so yeah thank you all thank you i actually uh it's is having trouble uh reconnecting to the space so hopefully she'll be back uh on soon but in the meantime uh sophia the other sophia <laughs> sophia g <laughs> <laughs> hello growing up in miami every other girl is sophia so i'm very used to uh sophia g as the as the uh the name. Um, anyway, I'm the, the founder of Art X Code. Uh, it's really just a place to support the. It happened to me too. The um, mic was off. Um, I don't know where I lost you guys, but um, I'm Sophia. I'm the founder of Art X Code, which is really just a place to support the algorithmic arts community in any way I can. So, curating exhibitions, hosting special projects, and uh, private sales. I also work with Code Art, which is a nonprofit uh, based in Miami, where we teach young girls how to make art with code. I've been doing that for um, a few years, and I, you know, handled their curriculum back in like 2015. I've, oh, <laughs> I keep seeing it comes off. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's really awesome to be here and. Honestly, it just feels like I'm t chatting with friends. I feel like I've worked with a lot of the artists here, or collected from some of the people in the in the audience. So um, yeah, just just happy to be here. Pretty much just a professional 
uh, generative art fangirl. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you. Nicole, uh, it still, still has problems, right? I know, yes. So okay, I don't know good. what, yeah, I don't know what to do because uh, she can't seem to enter the space. So I'm just chatting to her on DMs. But I guess, yeah, if you want to kick off. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's doing okay. it for me as well. It's just muting me whilst I speak. So, yeah, I yeah. think we have to watch the mic while we speak because it somehow mutes Oh yeah, mine's on, us. yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. Okay, I'll just watch the mic. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I mean, most of you are... Rafael is around, is around since over 20 years. So I'm wondering, what has changed for you when it comes to, to making your art, like especially um, in the last year um, due to NFTs? I mean, Rafael, you've been doing... Raphael, you've been doing installations pro with projections, for example, like very early on. Then you've done websites, and and now you're doing, um, yeah, NFTs. How how has that um, yeah. changed your I, your process? Well, I, I think the interesting thing of NFTs is that uh, the idea of generative art is that you see all the choices of an algorithm. And, and I was always used to. I made art with code, but I would always get to an end result, and that's what the, the viewer would see. And now you get to see all the choices that kind of the maker is seeing in his studio, his or her studio. So I think the generative, the, it, it's kind of mundane, but the value attached to a collection of works makes people look more intently and makes them understand what choices are being made when you're programming. So you're thinking, oh, let's move it a little to the left. Let's move it a little to the right. So in a way for me, generative art is, is a view inside the process and inside the studio of, of art making. And I think it has also made me expand more on certain ideas where before I would feel like, oh, this is done. And now I'm thinking, well, there's more here. Um, so it, it's been... I'm continuing from where I was working, but it's also a whole new way of thinking. And it, it's kind of kind of takes over your mind like it, it's hard to go back to the old way and and, uh, and then to me is the challenge with generative art to also s look for simplicity because very quickly things can become overcomplicated. so that there's a balance between offering a lot of choices for the algorithm but also making a decision as an artist and saying uh, this is the work Thank you, Raphael. Um, who would like to speak next about this topic? Helena, you've, you're also around. Maybe that's that's a good okay. question for you. <laughs> I guess okay. you have a lot to say to this to this topic. Uh, better not. <laughs> so, so for me, nothing much changed. Uh, j just uh, one thing is like this notion of scarcity because. By nature, I'm kind of like, I like sh sharing stuff. And it was like, uh, I needed to uh, uh, internalize this fact that like selling stuff online is different from sharing stuff online. So that's one kind of like important thing. Then it's also like, before I mostly created like prints or mostly like prints, physical artifacts. And then all of a sudden I started like doing stuff in, in the digital realm. And then kind of I got paranoid and basically checking every pixel in, 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 in the file just to make sure kind of it uh, is there. I, I don't sell something that like has glitches and stuff. So, so and also like crypto art, at least at the time when I started, was uh, very narrative that there were like stories uh, supplemented uh, with the like visual art. So though I like narrative, I was also kind of like uh, adopted this like flourishing uh, philosophy. That's pretty much three points I wanted to emphasize. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's a welcome. Great that that it finally seems to work and tech problems uh, <laughs> yeah, are solved. Um, Hi. It's not the first time, but this is the worst, definitely. Yeah. Um, where are we? 
uh, yeah, would you briefly like to introduce yourself? We've done an introduction round and have I've asked the first question, which is, um, yeah, what has changed um, for you, especially in the past year when it comes to making your art? What inspiration? Uh, no, no, what... Uh, first the introduction round so it would be great if you could just briefly introduce yourself and then my first question was but you can also pass that on what has changed for you when it comes to your artistic process uh, I mean some people like Raphael uh, are around since more than 20 years and he's been doing installations and websites and now NFTs so his artistic pro process has changed and I was wondering if that's the case for everyone uh, yes of course uh Well, first of all, happy to be here among friends. Um, I was telling Sofia, both Sofias, that I feel at home. Um, we're really close friends. And yeah, um, I've been both following and creating generative art for the past, yeah, it's now six years. Like I've been saying this for a year, but now it's now six years. Um, I um, I'm based in Panama. Central America, the Caribbean, uh, there's not too many uh, creators here, but the few out there are part of platforms like our blogs. And uh, somehow we have managed to group each other and support each other, even though um, it's very niche. Um, so I, I've been studying computer science uh, also for a while um, it's a um, difficult career very interesting and I'm I'm hoping I can finish in the next two years um, yes during this whole craze I was studying and also uh, trying to make a living as an artist going back to your question about what, how things have changed in terms of my process I think before I was really really just lost in my own dimension um and i talk a lot about how this artwork and this career was a way for me to heal and just uh find a safe place I find somewhere i feel comfortable happy and i did um i used to share not only every day but sometimes almost three artworks a day And I was I was really enjoying enjoying the reactions of of the people that started following me and also uh, what I could find within my art. Um, and my imagination just exploded when I started doing generative art and finding silhouettes, finding shapes in in abstract patterns it was just incredible for me and it still is. Um, this year, I've, I've I've been focusing more on creating a base for myself and for others, and uh, have been working in a lot of different projects. It's been incredible, um, and I'm, I'm I'm just really proud of where I've of what I've accomplished. Um, although sometimes I think that. I I really just want to go back to my little corner and make art every day, all day. And yeah, but I'm adapting and evolving. And I think um, I'm still doing so. Like I create a lot of things, but I don't share as often as before. That's the reality. Um, I do share a lot on Twitter. But uh, compared to how uh, I used to do it, um, it's not the same. And I'm totally fine with, with that fact. I'm, I'm not even scared that things have changed with me because um, I know I'm in love with this, uh, in love with sharing. Um, it's, um, it's just a phase where like, we adapt to the changes, to how overwhelming things can be sometimes. And also how exciting, like I'm extremely excited about the things that are coming. Um, yeah, like I'm, I'm just honest and like transparent. I'm like, yeah, that I think that answers your questions, I guess. 
thank you so much uh, it's a i think what all of you on here have in, have in common is that you that you create spaces for others and i think casey that that also or especially counts for you you're both an artist and the founder of a platform so i guess for you even more has changed um so yeah would would you like to add something to the question what has changed for you when it comes to your artistic process through, uh, through nfts over the last year yeah, thank you. Um, so much has changed, really. Um, maybe I'll touch on a few things briefly. I think one is the art blocks model of let's generate a thousand things and all of them need to work um, and work for me. It's been a huge change. I've always been a generate a thousand things and keep two kind of artist. That's been my practice. Um, and so that's been a really interesting shift uh, in the way that I work. Um, also, when I was really finding my focus around the early 2000s, the web wasn't able to, um, I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do through the browser. And so in the last year, you know, web technology has changed so much over the last 20 years. I'm now able to sort of make the work that I want to make and, and show it through the browser. Um, it really, until the pandemic hit, I was very focused on showing my work in galleries and institutions. Um, and so coming to the web with a new energy, it's been really exciting for me because I've been working online since the mid 1990s, I just haven't, that hasn't been the site of showing my work. So treating the browser as the primary site for the work has been very um, influential for me the last couple of years, kind of maybe catching up with Raphael a little bit um, in his way of working and thinking about distribution. I think the last thing I wanted to say is with Feral File, I think my best experiences in the art world have been through group exhibitions. I think the opportunity of working with a curator of showing work together with other artists and meeting other artists through that process those have always been my best experiences. And so the feral file model was about um, taking that and applying it to the browser-based context. And uh, the idea was to yeah, allow the curator and the artist to work together and, and to share that experience, but still put the work through the browser and have the work distributed in that way. The other thing that's really changed, I'm sorry, um, is collecting. Like I've never been able to afford work before. Like I couldn't afford, for example, like, um, all the artists who I considered peers. And so being able to work uh, in NFTs in the last few years has sort of allowed a lot of artists to begin collecting. And that's built into Feral File at, at the origin. When there's a group exhibition, the first thing that happens is the low edition numbers are all traded among the artists. And for me, that was really the most important thing. Let's get a group of artists together. Let's make new work. Let's show it together then let's swap work with each other. And that's really what Feral File is all about. And then extra additions are made and those are like a made available to collect. So I think, I don't know, that all those things have really changed. It's been a, a really extraordinary two years. Yeah, speaking to that change, I want to throw kind of a, an open discussion to the room and everybody has, I think, really important different angles um, on this subject, which is, when you're thinking about generative art in its creation, there's this kind of infinitude to it and this kind of um, capability for it to become anything. And then when we think about its uh, translation hello? to NFT, oh, hello? Is it hello? just me? I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear, oh, you can hear me? Okay, well, I'll I just, just start talking. I don't I know if they you. got rugged. Everything seemed quiet for a second. I, I was oh. just going to say, I, I was going to piggyback on what Casey was just talking about. Like, I think it was, it's been really cool for me. Like, so over the last year with art blocks and watching like, and seeing this kind of like the really cool network effect of, I, I was from before that I was kind of coming from the perspective and it seemed intuitive to me that like scarcity was like super important. And then, but then all, all of a sudden it kind of clicked like and seeing how fun it was to have a group of collectors pick up pieces from collections between like you know a couple hundred to a thousand pieces and then like but and it was like a way for artists to have additions but everybody because of the nature of, of generative work everybody could all the collectors could have their own unique piece and so I found that like super inspirational and exciting as a collector and that's why you know I got involved uh, with with what Eric was doing with with the test net, and then on, on on day one and minting squiggles and just having fun with it, and and everything has progressed way way faster. I think 
everybody would probably agree with that, but it's like, it's been, it's been, it's super exciting. And then it was the inspiration for brain drops. And so like when we founded brain drops, which is, um, pretty similar to like early art blocks. I mean, we have like 500 to a thousand pieces and they're priced around zero point. They're priced at 0.1 ETH. And so the idea for us is to kind of provide for AI artists, the similar thing as, uh, with the algorithm stuff. And I just think, um, yeah, I just think that to me, that's been the biggest change. I I can agree with like what Casey was saying, like the idea of, of having like, yes, like 0.1 ETH is, it's not, it's a relative thing. Right. But to, for, for a lot of the stuff out there that's in the NFT world, like 0.1 ETH is pretty affordable and I think it's accessible to a lot of people. So I think it's kind of like an exciting way to let people, let collectors in, um, and be able to grow with art with the artists as the movement like progresses and grows in a, into a more like mainstream form. Uh, so that's been like the coolest thing I think to me, like over the last year, just seeing the progression of of these larger collections. And I think a lot of it has to do with like I've thought a lot about it, and I and I think a lot of it has to do with with the them there being more fungibility um so like if somebody has and and that's one of the reasons i think why so many pfp projects have a lot of success is because you have like ten thousand pieces and if there's a whole bunch of common ones okay well someone sells one of their uh quote floor pieces for a certain amount and then the rest of the collectors uh it's not like a hard and fast rule but like for the most part like a lot of times a lot of collectors would be like you know well i don't want somebody else sold theirs for that beat that price so i don't want to sell mine for less and then it becomes uh like a network effect and then you also have all of these people involved um as collectors and talking about the project instead of just having like you know very a very select uh few collectors that are just collecting one of one pieces so yeah that's much two cents on on the last year and something that wasn't intuitive immediately to me, but has been really a cool thing. And the thing that I found most interesting about generative art. If, if I could, if I could reply to that, uh, because it's interesting to hear from the point of view of a collector. And I'm always thinking from the point of the view of a maker and that for me, art history, you only remember a few things. And the idea now that each artist maybe make 7,000 works per year. Whereas you remember, maybe you remember 12 paintings by Van Gogh, even though he made a thousand. But this idea of just creating multitudes and multitudes of work, I think traditionally the art world has been conditioned to think of the painting is the original and then the painter makes etchings or other kinds of engravings that are more affordable, but they're second tier. And now if, if the generative process becomes the primary medium, it's such a different way of thinking about art history, not thinking of these few icons, but just thinking of like vast and vast numbers. And then is the project as a whole, is, is the Chromie project one work or is each one a, a full work of its own? This may be a question to, to Eric. Um, do you see... One of the ironic things to me is that, that the, the art world has this whole history of the aura of the sacred object that you go to see. And then we switched to NFT and there was already a big transition. It's like, okay, it's an artwork, but you can't touch it. And now it's, well, it's an artwork, but there's 10,000 of them. And so maybe how I, that has been. I would actually love to, to touch on, uh, on that subject. Um, and really, because the way that I was uh, showcasing generative art a few years ago, you know, I was going to, um, like artist studios playing around, like checking out the the algorithms that they were working on and really picking one output from there. And then we would get it printed. Uh, and in order to really show collectors when it was on display, we would have printouts of the code for, for most of these pieces just to really hone into the fact that this was created with code. Because if you would look at them at first glance, you could think, oh, someone, you know, uh, just painted this or something along that sort. Um, And so I think now, especially with on-chain generative art, which has changed so much, you actually do get to, you are acquiring like the the aura 
of of the artwork, the performative act of it, um, you know, running in the browser, which is something that beforehand was I just always wanted to do, you know, have have the actual work running live um, at an exhibition, but really prints were were the best way to go about it. Uh, so yeah, I think now that's been the biggest shift that we actually get to own uh, the the code, the the piece itself. Um, and I think that's what makes generative art so special in the, in the age of, of NFTs. So um, I just, I, first of all, I, I want to answer Raphael's question, but then also I'm really curious for all the other artists on stage to answer this, because I think this is something that's so critical. I look at the Krovis Google as one piece of art that eventually up to 10,000 people will get to participate in that um, as, as owners. And because I think humans not all, but most humans are kind of driven towards individuality because we are all unique. I think that there is a value add for everybody having something that is unique that still fits within um, the family of a specific piece of art. So to me, you know, uh, the only NFT that I've ever created is the Chromey Squiggle. Well, there's a, some other weird stuff that I was tinkering with in the past. So um, that is one piece of art, in my opinion. And I just get to share that with, you know, a couple of thousand people. And there's a few people on this um, on the stage, like for example, Def Beef, which man, you know, huge props for everything that you've done. Like, you know, you, you are also putting out thousands. And when I, when I think of owning one of your pieces, I think of just participating in that one specific piece as like one performance and one, um, artwork, but I, I'd love to hear yours and everybody else's kind of specifically everybody else's, uh, stance on that. Maybe to jump in with a question to further kind of um, to push that conversation is like the larger question around the different um, sort of ultimate delivery of generative works. Like the fact that you can have anything ranging from a physical print on paper to, um, you know, something running live endlessly and only that one time to videos and then also specific NFTs. Like what's the process? Um, artistically, artistically, curatorially, and, and even in the case um, of institutions of figuring out what's the right means of actually delivering this work and sort of delivering the idea that's undergirding the work. I mean, I just, I, uh, now in December, I just did a, a show that was all, uh, and they were all NFT uh, based works. And a lot of it was, you know, chatting with the artist if one if it was it was kind of confused like like Casey I definitely had to ask him well, like what's the best way to showcase your circular works and we went uh forward with with projectors uh but there were some pieces that I thought you know prints will definitely bring the, the textures out more it'll it'll kind of honor the piece a, a bit better than just having it on a screen especially since we're still in those early stages of screens like I think Fidenza for example is like a four a three by four dimension and putting it on any other screen just didn't make sense. Um, and then there were screens, we found square screens for pieces that really did need to be uh, digital. Like I know Jeff Davis's color studies, they're not supposed to be printed. Uh, they're stills, but they should be printed. And then anything that was uh, animated, definitely have it on a screen so it can animate. Uh, the one that we kind of had, we took creative license with was uh, Eric's Chromie Squiggle, which we had as a as a hologram. Um, and that was kind of, you know, a collaboration between uh, Eric and, and and uh, some designers who who reimagined re it in 3D, uh, but on a curatorial stand, that's kind of you know the approach that we took, where you do kind of get to decide how you want to uh, display it or bring it out of the computer and, and bring it into the physical space, but um, you know also honoring the artwork itself in, in that decision. I think um, on this point, actually, Sophia, I'd love to like maybe touch as well on what you mentioned briefly before that when you were um, showcasing like uh, generative art, maybe like two years ago, you obviously like people could uh, not think about it as generated by code, because if you don't know what goes behind the actual work that you're seeing, especially physically, um, you might think it's a painting or other types of, of you know, creative output. So how do you think, and obviously it's a question for uh, the broader audience as well, like how do you think that gap and kind of that educational gap I guess is also bridged I know we had this conversation in person as well uh, in Miami but what are the things that you as you know like uh, an entity with art and code uh, but also like further uh, further questions for the speakers are, are doing to I guess like 
educate people on what is generative art and how to experience it. I mean, there's nothing better than having a, an in-person event to just be able to talk to people, to connect to them, to actually show them the work in, in the flesh and explain to them, uh, you know, what it means to create a generative system, to create a visual system and, you know, really get it through their, their head that it's not a computer that's creating uh, this artwork. Because the second you say, oh, like computer generated artwork or creative coding, they take the human side away from it. And I think uh, the one thing I always try to hone in is the fact that, you know, both artists start off with a blank, their blank canvas is an empty uh, editor, like a <laughs> text editor. And so they have to create these really, you know, intricate systems to create especially long form generative art. Um, and, you know, I think just talking to people and, and giving as many examples as possible is, is the best and really only only way to, to get it across. Um, but that's why I love putting shows on. I think the first, the first exhibition I ever did, I, exhibition is kind of a strong word, uh, like showcase of, of work, which was with Dimitri uh, Cherniak and Tyler Hobbs in 20, May of 2019, it was really just showing, I just wanted to show people the pieces that I had been collecting and what they were doing because I thought we needed to talk about it. Um, you know, it, that was that was really the, that was it. I was working at JP Morgan. I was a developer over there. I wasn't, um, I had no kind of business organizing a show, but I just really wanted to talk about it and make sure that people knew and, and took it seriously. And um, a few years later, here, here we are. Yeah, the thing that I've really been promoting a lot um, is is the history of this work. Um, you know, digital computers, generative art on digital computers is, you know, um, almost 60 years old now. Um, I really think of generative art as being uh, just a, uh, with computers as being a subset of generative works of art, which have been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I really like to take a long view to talk with people about the ideas behind it more than the technology and sort of, um, I think the more that we can relate what we're doing to these long different histories of different forms of art from music and sound and conceptual art, I think that's, that's a, for me, that's the plan for the long, for the long run. Yeah, I fully, I fully relate to what you say, Casey. Um, it, like in my case, I can say it happens very often that my work and for maybe it happens to Helena as well. Uh, our work gets shown like in a subset of AI art or machine learning art, etc. But like very often what I'm trying to do is just to open up a conversation about something that has nothing to do actually just with the technology itself. Um, like more about like how can we look at nature today within the framework of what we have and sometimes um, like the discourse around the AI makes it hard to get the message across because there's a lot of kind of AI in particular has a lot of uh, societal baggage so sometimes it's a little hard to to talk about it without you know, like being able to fully detach from the technology and, and look at it or, or like reframe what the technology can be used for. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> this is something that um, that but but at the same time, it's also important to have that representation, you know, to say like, well, look, there are there can be like uh, women who code, who make art, who, you know, all these things are super important for me to have as examples. And so I'm not like for one or the other. And that's where also you can have a community, community you know, um, and yeah, and feel more comfortable there. So just wanted to say that. Yeah, I want to say too, like that's a big reason for when we like behind creating brain drops, I think that a lot of the AI projects uh, are doing some cool, other projects are doing cool stuff, like Botto is cool, uh, Eponym is cool, but a lot of the focus is like purely on the tech. And so I think like with Braindrops, what we're trying to do is um, is showcase the humans behind the AI collaborative nature of the art. And, uh, and, and I think it'll just become more, I mean, we're still early on. We've only been around for like a, two months, so... But as we progress, 
uh, education and not only educating like people who want to get involved on the art- artistic side, but also educating collectors and explaining to them like, here's like the process behind all the all of the technology, but then also how important it is in terms of like what the data is going into the models because you know it really is only as good as i mean it's really so dependent on on the input that you have going into the into the model and if everything if everyone's just using the same like data sets and the same tools i mean i think i saw helena say the other day it's like what's the point you know and i totally agree with that there's a very liberating aspect to all the technology coming out with ai and so it's like to me it's most exciting to me because i think it's going to open up lots of intuitive tools to very creative people who are have these you know ideas in their head and they want to put it out there and and here's these new tools that are going to enable that and so i think like bringing the human uh aspect to the the art and in helping people not just when they think of AI, think of like some kind of like existential threat, but seeing it as like, okay, this is what it really is like and what's really going on. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's, it's part of the conversation, part of the community that we're trying to build with raindrops. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, we, we have a question um, from, from Sasha. Um she she's curious and I, I was wondering that as well has has drop culture turned generative art into a performance and then i was wondering if it is a performance for you is that one that takes place or happens in collaboration with a computer or the algorithm like rafael this might be something for you i guess uh, because you've you've done some bigger drops um yeah i think a lot of people here did big drops but it, it's um I think the whole NFT thing, I started, you make internet art like in the before times, 20 years ago, and you would just put stuff online. You wouldn't even, there wasn't even really tracking who was visiting which website. If someone sends you an email, hey, I like that thing. So there wasn't that much feedback, but I keep thinking of the, the painter Morandi, the Italian painter who his whole life, he just made still lives of bottles on the table. And it's kind of generative art. So he had an algorithm. I have 12 bottles and I'm going to keep rearranging them. And there's a blue bottle and a green one. And maybe there's a flower. And and he would, I don't know his pace of work, but he would just slowly make these paintings completely separate from the world at large. And so now we are building algorithms, which at the press of a button can generate 10,000 mints. And then the community together decides which one is valuable and somehow either through rarities or through taste. But that sort of direct feedback loop with an audience, I think, is very new for, for any kind of cultural creation. It's sort of, you're writing a novel, and while you're writing it, it like you test it, and then people get back to you, like, oh, I like that sentence. I like that sentence. So uh, I think it's so new. It, it really is a new genre that years later, we'll, we'll realize what it is. It's really just as I'm making it, it was really exciting to see how people respond to different things. But I also tried to get back in the mode of Morandi and just think like, I'm in my studio. I don't care what anyone thinks because when you think, when you worry too much about uh, what people think of it, I don't, I, I kind of block. So you have to keep the world outside a little bit when you're making. Yeah, in the early 2000s, there was a really vibrant um, creative coding culture online, and it was completely non-commercial. Everybody would just release their work. They posted onto their own custom websites that they custom coded. Um, they would release the source code with it, and then they were just. I would spend hours a day on different um, bulletin boards, you know, looking at other people's code, talking about other people's code, helping people with coding questions. Um, I, and for me, so what's happened in the last couple of years with NFTs and everybody on Discord and Clubhouse, et cetera, it's, it's really felt like a return to those early days in terms of the, the community and, and the culture around showing work and just releasing work online whenever you want to, like free of any kind of um, schedule or institutional involvement. But we all know like the main difference here is that now um, things are being collected and there's 
there's cryptocurrency involved, and which is a huge difference. But there there are things that have been continuous through the creative coding community that that have come back in the last couple of years. Yeah, j just to respond briefly, I, I think it would be naive to say that money doesn't become part of the creative process, but you try not to let it infect you or think about it, but it's it does involve like, oh, if I make a, a project that's a thousand units or one unit, it's just a very di different economic model. And I try to not think about it, but I'm sure it, it gets in your brain. So maybe that is a unique thing, this idea of money and art being so closely tied and the moment of release is a moment of sale. That's something I wasn't used to. Yeah, um, I wanted to reply to Rafael before when you mentioned that you just lock yourself in your studio. Um, I think I, I'm the same in, in a way, but at the same time, I've created a lot while sharing stories. While, um, even while sharing other artwork, I think I find a point where I can focus uh, better. Same as when I am playing a game. I think gaming for me is like training. Um, I just, my, my, my brain just focuses way more. Um, I get into the achievement mode or into just following instructions in a better way and hyper-focused. And then when I go into making art, I, I, I'm going with the same mentality and then and so on. Um, yeah, um, I think I have like an open studio at this point where I, I make stories and depending on what I see or what someone someone uh, thinks about my work, even if it's like I, I barely get any um, critics, which I think is, <laughs> is bad. Lately, I've been thinking that I wish um, someone would come with like some difficult questions or something like challenging for my art, but... So far, I feel like a lot of people around me have told me that they feel like in a safe place uh, when they are around me, maybe because I'm shy or I'm like quiet or no, I, it, it depends. I mean, it I change a lot throughout the day and I put a lot of myself in my art and depending on how I'm feeling, like regardless of... Uh, the program I'm working in, uh, that's that's that'll be what would shape the final output. And also, I think I work a lot with rhythm. Um, I feel like I can feel when I lose the rhythm or when I go back into it. It's like dancing for some reason. Like it's just it's a strange way to work, but it works for me. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Raphael's methods. Eric, uh, maybe a question for you as well, kind of going back to uh, the point that we made uh, earlier around like displaying uh, generative art, like obviously you've opened the space uh, for art blocks and Marfa. Uh, you did the first like opening, which was uh, amazing. Like what are you, uh, what are your thoughts regarding that space and like how do you envision it as a, hub for education as a hub for displaying uh, generative art? Like, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, man, there's so much to say about that. Um, so uh, first of all, yes, we want a hub for education and, and, and then just like a home uh, for, for generative art, um, at least in Texas near us and something that can be supported by art blocks in a way to where it doesn't require you to buy anything there. Like you can literally just be an exhibition and, and share this work with the world. And it, it's something that's very meaningful to me, even though it's kind of a remote location, it's a location that has a lot of um, inspiration and in, in at least creating art blocks. And um, I think the other thing is, I mean, you don't want to impose inspiration on other people, but the idea of being able to have residencies out there, which, you know, um, uh, could, could be coming soon. Um, and, and kind of letting people immerse themselves into that uh, very remote and very beautiful, huge sky environment, I think is just something that's so valuable. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess artists can then decide, you know, that, that was great, but that wasn't worth the nine to 
24 hour commute. And so maybe that doesn't really work out, but I do, I'm dying to share that part of my life with uh, artists and, uh, and just with the community in general. And last year, the response that we got with the amount of people that came out uh, to me was just hugely in, like validating, but also it was like the most I've ever gotten to share something special with a bunch of people. Um, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things that's changed in my life in the last year, uh, my whole life is upside down, but one of them is that, you know, I, I went from like just watching beautiful generative art pieces and just kind of like um, thinking that, you know, I, I, I still think all these artists are like celebrities and just like looking at them as unapproachable to actually feeling um, uh, accessible. And uh, in many cases, I've become friends with a lot of these artists, which is just mind blowing. Like I, I never would have thought that this would happen. But uh, if you take that one step further, I, I don't just get to be friends with these artists, but like this community, this discord community and or NFTs and crypto Twitter has enabled the collectors to become friends with the artists and the artists to have a different uh, place to come, come, you know, come together and, and share their experiences, whether it is discord. I know that, you know, a lot of artists had previous methods of co like communication and, and, uh, and so to, to me, Marfa can hopefully be just a place where you can just detach yourself from society and really just sit there and talk about what you want to talk about, which for us is, uh, generative or algorithmic art and um, let people just kind of uh, be around each other without the distractions of the city. And I, the responses that I got from that event were so positive and like, I still, you know, am, am kind of glowing from that. And I just can't wait to have more of those in the future, especially once, you know, this, you know, it, 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 this is such a wildly speculative market, but ultimately like there are, I, I, it's hard for some people to believe, but like it, there are people that really just give a shit about the art like purely. And of course, you know, uh, we understand the economic incentives and we understand the economic alignment, but it's just really nice to think that, you know, um, there, there can continue to be these yearly or, uh, twice a year meetups there. Um, and regardless of whether crypto is high or low, uh, you might have these same regular people that are actually drawn by this art form, by this medium. Uh, and that's what I'm looking forward to reflecting on in three or four years and, and, uh, in kind of our journey for our blocks. And uh, one brief question: How do how do you exhibit the work? Is it is it on screens? I mean, I've seen photos on. Yeah, Mike, we've seen you. I just wanted to briefly ask Eric because I yeah. think he has to. You have to leave shortly, right? So I'm and, okay. And it's important. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, but for sure, the you know the the print on some that are not animated and or are animated but grab color well, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digital screens you know nothing at the level of what Sophia did in Miami oh my gosh I still think about that every day but still um very uh uh you know like a, a mix of things and I think for example like one thing that I think is lacking from the house that I think would be really wonderful we have an artist named Elida Sun that made this beautiful piece that and, and maybe I'm biased because I'm big into projectors I'm a huge projector nerd and projection mapping but it's this piece that's kind of meant to be this installation piece and I think you know Uh, we have the opportunity out there to do something like that in, in a semi-permanent way. And so we want to keep exploring that internally. We want to keep exploring that with Sophia and with other kind of just, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are wanting to show NFTs and a lot of people are going to come with new ideas to the table. And hopefully within, you know, a year or so, there's going to be some really nice standardized ways of, of displaying and enjoying this art beyond uh, looking at it on OpenSea. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think it's difficult to like. I've reached out to several television manufacturers recently, just like begging them actually to look into the potential because I have a lot of contacts in the hotel industry, and like they do design and, and they build these things out. They own the hotels. They in strong relationships with the the people that do all the design. And they're very interested. They talk to me all the time, ask me questions about digital art, but they don't understand, like, is it supposed to be printed and then, like, put into a frame or are there actual, like, digital frames to use? And I think that there's just a really big gap in the market in terms of delivering a really high-quality experience uh, with, with digital frames. Like, there's some cool stuff. Like, token frame looks really cool, but I don't know if, like they've been able to handle all the demand, but I like how they have 
like square aspect ratio and then they you can flip from vertical to horizontal and they also have some pretty big sizes so if there's just more options like that i think you'll see a lot more adoption from people who aren't just speculators but people who really are interested in in having this stuff and hanging up in their houses or in hotel rooms stuff like that quickly going to take this moment to uh shamelessly plug luma canvas um really incredible high grade leds for digital art um which you can go see if you're in la at vellum la um and also speaking of la um we have mika who has communicated that um, she has a question so i want to open to her hey uh thanks for that segue <laughs> um and i loved your show at vellum it was beautiful um yeah, I had a question to pose to the group, um, kind of. I was just actually asked by Artsy, um, who I just published an article with about um, sort of the debate behind whether NFTs are art, the like Wikipedia nonsense. Um, but they really wanted to curate, or they asked me to curate a show uh, for March for Women's Month. Um, of NFTs that ha- are sort of like generative or use AI, um, basic have like really involved technology in the process of the creation, um, not just the sort of distribution, and have the it also benefit girls who code. And so, obviously, I was really excited by this I really want to do everything I can to you know support women in the space um and as someone who's made a generative collection it's that's I also really care about that but just kind of thinking more about it and listening to everyone talk um well one I I mentioned you know partly like in some ways to focus just on women feels like it's reinforcing this sort of gender binary. And my, I think there's so much gender fluidity in the space um, that it didn't feel quite right to just have it be quote unquote women artists or women NFT artists. So I proposed to them kind of doing more a show of work people that make feminist artists in a irrespective of gender or make feminist work or are feminist artists uh, irrespective of gender and then I'm also kind of I guess wondering if pe- like I want to uplift this I know I care about the generative art sector but also don't kind of want to uh, ghettoize it or like sort of fetishize the tech aspect or have it override the content, which I kind of hear people talking about, and just wondering if people have thoughts or feedback um, about it. I have a quick feedback about it. Uh, like, have you heard of uh, Caroline? Uh, I hope I'm saying her name right, but Caroline uh, Sinders? I haven't, but okay, so like someone I should know. She's an artist, but also like uh, has an activist project called uh, Feminist Dataset, and it's about like interrogating the processes that lead into machine learning. So I was kind of talking about earlier about how important the data that goes into the actual that's fed into the models is, and so that would be somebody that you might want to look into and talk to. Um, you know, uh, just a thought there. Yeah. I have actually put this out to the whole group. If there are artists that you recommend for this show, can you please DM me <laughs> um, or at me or anything? Uh, I'll also post a tweet about it, but I would love, I'm putting like an open call out there for it. One thing I wanted to dial back on getting to, uh, to concept um, is something that we touched on a little earlier where when we're thinking about the algorithm as collaborator, machine as collaborator, if there's a spectrum for that with the different projects that you're approaching, is, is there a spectrum in these projects where 
in some cases you're you're as an artist thinking of yourself strongly as a curator and in other cases thinking strongly as as having like a you know a strong authorial hand um or do you have kind of one poetics about your approach to your generative art and you stick to that across all of your different projects okay i can take it elena um it uh, probably depends on, on the project like you said so with something like steels uh, i usually curate like very heavily but recently i started doing something that is called i call animations which is basically animated uh, sequence of panels produced by ai and in this case i basically let uh, machine do the sequence and i go with it i mean sometimes if it doesn't work at all then i discard the thing but uh, typically i let i mean there is a stronger say to machine than my own curation so i would say it's like depends on the project Yeah, I'll hop in too and just say like with Braindrops, so we have right now like the first seven projects have been all artist curated. So they've just, they've had their project and a lot of output and then they just are curating the pieces that they want to include. But my co-founder, uh, Gene Kogan, uh, who's, who's been involved in the scene, you know, all the way back with like Ian Goodfellow, 2014, 2015, really when GANs were first coming out, and he was one of the first people tinkering around with the ideas and, and he's really plugged into the scene. And so he's been working on a project called Abraham since about 2019, like probably early 2019. Uh, and the idea was, is with Abraham is to create a, a fully autonomous artist. And so what we're doing is, and it's already up and running actually Abraham.ai. You can go to uh, Abraham.ai slash creations and it's, it's very similar setup to eponym if you're familiar with that. Like you put in the text and then uh, an image comes out. Like the AI will, will create an image uh, depending on what, what the text prompts were. But all of the back end that goes into that, we're, uh, the plan is to utilize that for brain drops. So it's not just going to be the in the future. The plan is to expand beyond just the artist curated stuff. We'll have... Uh, more community curated stuff, which is somewhat similar to Botto, but it'll just be like on a larger scale. Uh, and also community curated in terms of the community having a say uh, in terms of text prompts and things like that. We're really trying to be like, uh, we don't want to limit things. Like we want to, if somebody, ha if an artist has an idea, we're trying to be like super flexible and allow them to see it through on the platform. Uh, and then the third level of curation would be, uh, uh, AI curated so it would actually be the artist has uh, the human artist comes up with a concept for their uh, like for the, for the full collection and an idea aesthetically and has a data set that they've fed into it and an idea of traits and, and all these things and then it'll be very similar to the art block experience where you just essentially press mint and then the artwork is created on the fly um, and everybody sees it at the same time. So, because I, I think there's like three different, especially like with AI art, uh, curation is uh, such a big part right now. But I think as the technology is getting better and better, like you'll start to see uh, some pretty cool projects be be able to 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 uh, just be created on the fly. So that's something that we want to explore. And they could be super experimental stuff. They could be uh, pretty polished, but we're putting in that Abraham pipeline into the back of brain drops to enable that for, for the future. I just wanted, can I reply? Oh, yeah. just, it, sure, sure, I sure. Find, Sorry. What I find interesting is that uh, it seems with technology and AI, it really helps to create a lot of stuff, but it would be interesting for AI to also start narrowing down where somehow AI understands what makes one work more interesting than another. And I, I one of the things I found very intriguing when I started with art blocks is like, how would the community de decide which one is more valuable than another one? And so for an AI to decide, it, I think it's, it's normal. 
it, it's quite hard to say which artist is better than another. Like everyone has their own preferences. But when you go to a museum and you see the body of work of one artist, it's pretty clear which one are the winners. It's a mysterious thing, but somehow humans understand that. And I'm curious if AI in the future will sort through all these NFT works and decide, no, this is the one. I actually have a, a comment on that also, because I, I think with, with generative art, there's this idea of, you know, like the objective rarity that's kind of added into the the system that an artist creates, but then there's just the subjective side of it too, where something can just look really stunning, even if it isn't quote unquote rare. Um, I think that's why also just like curation and, and, um, individual thought is important in in the space and, and really just being able to take a look at artwork that is just beautiful but maybe doesn't have these like you know rare traits or whatever because I think right now there's like there's a huge focus on that um and yeah I, I, that really just made me think of 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 that I think it, it was something I really wanted to capture um in December to the Fidenza that we showed uh, had zero rarity traits to it. It was cons- like it it's had no statistical rarity, but the output was actually extremely, extremely rare. Um, and that's something that I think is is just important to to talk about right now. I think uh, what gives that writerly level to an artwork these days is like that a huge influencer or a collector that is trying to pop their project, like start sharing it and like a lot of followers just think that that's the one, that's the one that you should follow. But in the meantime, there's so many other projects on artworks that are uh, that are out there that are beautiful, that are interesting and people don't get to see it unless it's shared by one of these influencers. So yeah, I, I second that, Sophia. There should be more creation and also like trust people that has been sharing art for a long time before uh, there was the incentives of being collected, right? Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about Creative Code Art, um, which is a platform that's been growing for the past four years. and. I, I've been sharing art there as well as Artix Code by Sophia. Uh, she's been sharing her own view or like the things that she considers interesting and aesthetically uh, pleasing or just emotionally uh, in, like immersive. And I also share a lot of um, audiovisual experiences. Like Eric said before, I'm, I'm very into immersive art and projection mapping and things like that. So there's a little bit of everything out there. And if we're going to be in the space and building together for a long time, I think we should start focusing on things, uh, on like creating our own um, sense of taste, I guess, instead of just following what's the next pump or what this huge collector or this huge influencer is, is sharing. Like, that's boring. <laughs> and. And I think I get tired and I stop being on Twitter for a bit every time that, that I see the swarm of shielding happening. Um, I really like want to protect that side of, you know, what we've built on social media. Uh, like Rafael said before, like we've, we are like working in an open studio now where we get inspired by the things we see around us. So we gotta we gotta fight to protect that rather than just uh, um, making art into just an asset or a market strategy or whatever like other people tries to do. And I'm not criticizing like people that makes the market because obviously like that gives us a lot of attention to the space. But what I'm criticizing us is that we focus too much on it and we forget like what really really matters when we notice like we've lost our soul for art and that's uh, that's really sad yeah also to to get back to like with the ai being like able to decipher between like what's good and bad i kind of think to it i mean these are neural networks and they're only as good as the data that they have right so like as the computing systems get bigger and more and more data is fed into them, I think that they'll be able to decipher and have a lot less bias. 
you know, because if, if they're only being, I mean, there's been, you know, we don't need to go over that stuff. I think everyone's familiar, like with the biases that have happened, like already, you know, just feed more and more data into, into these neural networks. And then eventually if they have, have an, have enough, I mean, could come to a point where like somewhat indisputable, uh, when it comes to like, uh, just the human brain power, power compared to like massive neural networks that are that have all the data available to it. Uh, we want to open it up to a few questions that are coming uh, from the audience. So I'm going to bring up um, a few people, and we'll take a few questions. Hey, Phoebe, I hope I'm saying your name right. No, that's all good. My name is Gabriel anyway. Um, we, okay. are, <laughs> we, we are a fashion brand from Germany. Um, and as it used to be in the, in the old days, um, uh, our brand is called um, like the, the designer, which is Phoebe. Um, first of all, thank you for having that space. Um, I'm, I'm feeling very at home here. It's a very laid down and uh, well thought of uh, thought out thoughts and so on. It's uh, something different than than all these hype channels for PFPs and so on. So, thank you for that. Um, as I said, we we have a fashion brand and we do like these high tech sportswear stuff where we work with um, innovative textiles and, and wearables. Um, we did like the blackest T-shirt in the world and uh, a black T-shirt that doesn't heat up under the sun and, and wearables like like self-defense jacket for women. So all these very technical things, everything we do is in black. And uh, now we pivoted into Web3 totally. So like um, one of our core things has always been function. And that is something that is very interesting now in Web3 as well, because, I mean, there's so much more you can do that brings me to this thought I always had and that is um, well I mean this this whole thought started years ago when I thought where, where will fashion go at some time and then I thought somewhere you will have kind of nanobots who assemble around you and will make some kind of, of garment for you whatever you want to have in that situation very quickly and it can be very creative and so on now this is light years in the future but now with Web3, we can actually do that. So I find it very interesting to think about um, generative um, um, clothing. And this is this whole new medium is starting right now. We're in this Digital X framework where there's been like all these digital fashion brands being spun out and so on. And um, yeah, now the, the uh, question is, have any of you thought about that using like fashion as a medium for example i mean we we had a project our first nft project here in the space was um like to update kind of the iconic akira jacket which most of you know this red one which nobody would wear nowadays but we combined it with our like high-tech look and we had a, an, an ai to like mesh together all these pictures if that's the, <laughs> the right word for it it was very interesting because then it turns out that, that like doing that is a design process in itself. But now the the um, my question is like from the from the output side, has have any of you seen something like that or is interested in in looking into it to have like a garment in some kind of metaverse? Well, right now it's not interoperable yet, but then you could use, I don't know, VR chat or whatever would work best technically with a garment that would then react on its environment that can be all uh, different kinds of inputs like music, sound, words, light, other people, the fear and greed uh, index. Um, so the, the possibilities are endless there. But... Yeah, let me know if that is something that you guys are are interested in or thinking about. Uh, I'm I'm not an expert on it, but I do have a friend who is. So I'm just gonna shout her out really quickly. Her name is uh, Danny Loftus. She goes by Danny does not exist on Twitter. Uh, she is going all in on 
all things digital fashion and it's just she's been writing white papers on the subject so i would definitely recommend uh reaching out to her she has a lot of really great insights on that yeah i'm gonna jump in and just say that uh, i think that the least friction uh example of generative manufacturing is the digital space and like the virtual and digital space and, and uh, nfts are enabling a pretty interesting way of uh, not only exposing that to the world, but also trading um, you know, property rights. But I, I do think that generative manufacturing is very much going to be in a future. And uh, there's been a couple uh, kind of partners that I've been working with, um, with the art blocks that are kind of exploring that and just literally at the entry level. But, you know, we have a uh, a, a platform that people can generate a, a 2D plot using a plotter directly from the browser. And, you know, that's called plottables. And I fully think that there's going to be 3D printables and CNC-ables. And eventually you might be, you know, creating a one-of-one -one kind of generative output for clothing. I absolutely believe that you're going to see that for clothing first in patterns, then maybe using 3D printing technology and shape and flow and design. Uh, I, I think it's just a matter of time. I think we are just right now seeing the lowest friction possible examples um, right now. And then over time, uh, we'll see way more complex things. And I'm excited about it. I think the future is very bright for generative um, as, a, as a manufacturing technology. Yeah, I totally agree. And also just the nerd in me wants to just say this. So it's kind of interesting, like around 1800, uh, this guy... Joseph Jacquard actually created a punch card system. It was a binary system. He had like 24,000 punch cards. And I think uh, I don't know, 1830s or something like that, they created a tapestry of a portrait of him. And so it could be like possibly like considered the first uh, digital image. I, I just wanted to interject that the only irony is that uh, so NFT is the marriage of, of code-based art and finance, and then maybe in fashion. And just meeting all the nerds, they don't care about money or fashion, and they're kind of terrified of it. So we'll we'll have to do some work to get those worlds together because all the people I know who do generative art just wear hoodies and, and don't care about their clothing. might be different in the metaverse though maybe they want more than hoodies in the metaverse who knows um and uh, since we are already speaking about the past i was wondering um when when you create work or when you are thinking about i don't know curating a platform and working with new artists uh, do you also look back in in in, in history and um yeah do you have heroes or inspiration or do you look um yeah um what what were questions artists were asking themselves when they started doing generative art? For example, Herbert B. Franke, um, who was very interested in exploring randomness, for example, in the 60s. Um, yeah, do you do you have heroes? I guess that would be my main question. I'm I just going to jump in and say it because he's on the stage, but I think Casey Reese is really probably a huge fact that we can even have this conversation, him and his team and processing in p5.js and i know that there's a bunch of other softwares and platforms and and things out there but uh i i do like daily i'm looking at a, a beautiful piece that he created that is on my screen it's not even an nft oh my gosh but uh i just look back and i think that um you know you have everyone from frank and uh back in you know back in the 60s and they they paved the way but i think what really kind of um triggered or what made this all possible was kind of this idea of that you could help educate people on how to create beautiful visual things with code. And so I just want to express my gratitude. He knows how I feel, but you know, it's just crazy to be on stage with him. I feel like I have to respond to that, but I don't know how. Um, thanks. Thanks for the kind words, Eric. Um, I mean, all, all that first generation are really my heroes. Um, Vera Molnar, Manfred Moore, um, Harold Cohen, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think for, for my kind of generative work, um, the time is so important, choreography, and the way the work grows and performs in time. So a lot of my heroes actually are from music um, um, and people doing experimental music notation and experimental forms of ambient music, I think, uh, come into play with my work and my ideas uh, just as much as the 
the first generations of uh, digital art pioneers. Hi guys, I have, I have a question. I have a question actually. That kind of leads off of that. Sorry, Chris, is that is that cool? Um, yeah, sure, go. Thanks. Uh, hey, I, so I've been listening to this conversation and I've been thinking a lot about generative art recently with my own work and whether I actually make generative art and the history of modernism and stuff like that. And do you guys think that um, generative art is basically just about non-human made design decisions? Because there's so many examples of systems art where people kind of come up with systems, but then they actually make human made design decisions inside of those systems. Uh, shall I answer? Somebody else? It, 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 I just it, to me, yeah. Oh, yeah, to me, that that question of the the human decisions was the first twenty years, and now it's more open with with generative. So, to me, that felt like two different periods. But you think it's like the same category? Well, it, it, it to me, it felt like being a bit more generous in in the sense of letting people into the process and. What I think is really great is that I've shown work as projections before and people couldn't tell whether it was a, a projection, whether it was code based or video. There was just no way to tell if you just see that. And now that you're in the browser and you're looking at all these different permutations of the same algorithm and you can check the code and that makes programming really more human so it, it's like oh this same algorithm can go yellow it can go red it can go blue it can go to the left it can go to the right and all of a sudden people really feel programming instead of understanding it rationally it's like oh you really understand what it's doing it's it's kind of yeah and i kind of feel like when i look at the large generative uh generative nft projects i feel like the design decisions that gener generative artists used to make for themselves to get work out of the studio has now been outsourced to the market where the best works are kind of chosen by everybody if that makes sense like crowdsourced so in a I way mean, the artist kind of relinquishes aesthetic control the uh, so generative art as a whole i mean one of the key components of that is uh like the autonomous side of it so yes making a set of rules but letting, allowing it to have you know some semi-autonomous side to actually execute on that um and so generative art is kind of a, a catch-all for a bunch of different techniques i think right now um I personally like to refer to it as algorithmic artwork. A lot of the work that we're seeing, especially like on art blocks where artists are, are writing code and being very clear. I mean, on the aesthetic side of it, I think the artists are very, very explicit, I think, about what they're trying to accomplish. And yes, there are these like really wonderful surprises that happen uh, with your code where you might get something new, kind of like if you're painting, you might like your, your hand might go somewhere else and those <laughs> Bob Ross happy, happy little accidents. But um, I'd say the to create a generative system, especially like the artists on art blocks, like long form generative art, it's extremely difficult uh, to, to do. And I think um, the artists have to have a really you know robust they have to set a lot of really robust uh parameters to get these types of output so they know what they're trying to to get across in terms of aesthetics and then they they kind of just expand on that in in a whole other way it it just seems to me in some ways it's more connected to manufacturing history than conceptual art and i say this as a generative artist actually so i'm you know in the space Cool. I think we might have uh, time for one last question from Chris, uh, and then we'll close it off. Hey, Chris. Hey, how's it going, guys? It's my first time in this room, but so thanks for having me here. I am a generative artist, and I've been using audio input for um, my main medium. I was just um, actually wanted to give a shout out to Casey. He's uh, my old, he was he was the person who taught me processing and greatly influenced my trajectory to be here. So thank you, Casey. Um, my question today is actually for Eric and and Casey. Um, I've been curious on how an artist like us, just a generative artist who's been making work for a while, uh, get, how how do we go about in 
applying to spaces like Feral Fire as well as Art Blocks. Thank you very much. Well, mine's kind of easy right now. We Our Blocks has our applications closed till March. We've uh, amazingly, uh, considering I, I started our Blocks with extra scripts just in case nobody cared to put art out on it, but we've had a lot of in, uh, intense kind of uh, applicants. So we are closed for applications until March and we have this huge project underway to where we never close applications again. It's quite an undertaking, but until March and until we get that process in place, Things are um, things are closed. Once March comes around, whether it's beginning or middle of March, we are hoping to uh, Discord is kind of where everything lies for us. And so you would just join our Discord. It's uh, discord.gg forward slash artblocks. And there's an applications channel there and you can keep up. And in the meantime, it's a good idea to have your scripts ready to go. Uh, so, you know, be in that channel and, and hang out with some fellow creators. It's really, uh, I think, a kind of a special place to hang if you are in the generative world. Yeah, I'm a really big fan of the Tezos-based platforms that are completely non-curated. Former Hicket Nunc, uh, now Versum, and Hicket Nunc community, and others that are that are emerging. Um, I, you can make something there, mint really inexpensively, and just kind of like cut your teeth and explore and experiment, and and you know find community there. I think that's a, a great way to begin. Um, Frail Files a little bit of a different beast because everything is um, instigated by a curator. So we do have open calls for curators, but we don't have any way for artists to join Feral File at the moment. That's something that I puzzle about a lot, but we haven't we haven't figured it out yet. Um, Chris, it's good it's good to hear you. It's been a while. Okay, cool. So I think we're up at the nine, just over ninety minutes. Um, so we. Yeah, we just wanted to thank everybody for coming. This was such a good uh, conversation. We do these talks every week. Um, the next one will be next Tuesday, and we'll talk about blockchain as a medium. Um, and yeah, it'll be at the same time, 8 p.m. Uh, set, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, yeah, discovering uh, different topics around art NFTs. So thank you to all of our speakers. It was great to have you on. And thanks to Jesse and Annika. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for joining us. We'll, we have recorded this and we'll share it on Twitter and we'll also upload it to YouTube so you can listen to it afterwards. Thank you. You can hear all the, all the chaos from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Yeah, you. thank you so much.